welcome to Riffforge Studios. And this time we have something a little bit different um, as part of our Processes and Principles series, which might take off depending on how popular this one is. Um, but this is a look into the conversion process and the principles behind making custom minis, thinking about what we want to achieve from that, and just generally trying to sort of help people um, as requested this has been something that was um, requested a little bit on the Instagram channels in terms of trying to help people think a little bit outside the box in terms of how you might go about crafting some of these custom minis and I know a little bit in terms of the commission community sometimes there can be a little bit of a reservation around sharing what might be seen as tips and tricks or seen as kind of you know part of a uh, almost secretive process um, see behind the curtain as it were but in real terms I don't really think that's something to worry about too much and you know we'll take you through things like this relatively simple conversion from this Alpha Legion Praetor it's from one of my previous armies um, still something I'm quite fond of but as you can see he didn't make it past the primer stage at this point um, but it'll take us through some of these more simple um, conversions right the way up to what I think is one of the more complex conversions that I've done in recent history which is this Night Lords Apothecary or Primus Medicae whichever way you want to look at it and as you can see straight away there's a striking difference even with the, the Linnaean uh, Praetor being a little bit you know being primed you can still see that there's a vast difference really in terms of time spent quality the parts used but that's not necessarily to say that one is better than the other or that less quality or less time spent sorry actually leads to less of an outcome um and i think you know that that old saying less is more is sometimes applicable sometimes you know some legions some conversions you want to throw the bells and whistles out right you want like this this night lord's praetor at the front he has a lot more going for him he's a little bit busier whereas some of the other models are a little bit more reserved but still convey you know kind of a similar aesthetic and i think that's one of the the crucial points here really is that you don't have to just go for the orc approach you know dip your model in glue dip him in your bits box and whatever comes out is kind of what you're going to run with you don't need to do that sometimes it might be required sometimes it might not be but that's what this video is here for you know to help understand what it is you're trying to achieve from the end point of a model what you're trying to display in that model what feeling you want that model to have and i think that's something sometimes people perhaps overlook is that as part of the planning process and i have a planning process for for every one of these models some of them it might be five or ten minutes some of them it might be you know a couple of days while i really try to think about how i want these models to look but it's how you want that model to feel when it's finished in terms of you know how it looks does it convey what you want to convey is your character being portrayed in the correct way you know some of this stuff is custom characters for custom um, for custom commission requests some of this is trying to replicate existing characters in the law um, on that note shout out to one of um, one of my hobby friends who managed to lose a custom Arvida conversion that I did for a for a friend a couple of Christmases ago um, I still owe a replacement for that, but yeah, um, a Revual Arvida pre Grey Knights um, conversion that was that was lost in transit. So cheers for that, Craig. Um, but a big part of this, like I say, is just what you want to emulate, and that can be really daunting in some cases for some people. You know, some people um, don't necessarily feel that comfortable with this. So I'm going to walk you through some of the simple versions left to right and start to really build a picture of what we might want from a conversion and how we think about that and how I think about that. And that's not to say, of course, that that's the way everyone should think about it, but it's the way I might think about it. So take this um, champion, for example, working left to right across the board as you see it. This is um, converted from one of the New Age of Darkness models. It's what I believe has been kind of 
colloquially referred to as Sword Guy from the new box. He's the Sword Praetor. As you can see, he's quite large. I think this is um, in a kind of heroic scale as opposed to a traditional um, scale. He's quite a lot bigger than um, the other Mark Sixes that come in that kit. But this is an expression of just difference with that model in terms of what you might be able to do to make it look a little bit more unique. And how we approach this really was a combination of the thought process in my head of what I wanted to do on this guy, what I wanted to change, but was influenced, of course, by um, the client who had um, a vision for how he wanted this to look. And that was kind of not necessarily late heresy, but not early heresy either. You know, this guy is stereotypically arrogant. He's an emperor's children champion. So of course there's going to be an element of, of arrogance with that. He's going to be quite showy, but he isn't all chaos bells and whistles at this point yet. You know, he hasn't had a manipulated voice box or whatever that we can see. Um, and of course that comes with its different challenges. So as you can see, I've just pointed out there, one of the first challenges really was extending the arms, a little bit of minor green stuff in. Other than that, that's about the most technical process that I had with this. And that was mostly because of the scale on this this guy being so wildly different to the rest of the parts that I had in the bits box. Outside of using the specific arms that come with this guy, there's going to be a little bit of manipulation needed with the parts used. And that's mostly, like I say, because he is quite a chunk. And actually the arms on this... One arm is from a Primaris um, Marine, and the other arm is off a Chaos Marine. The the offhand with the small dagger is off a Chaos Marine. And it took me a little while to get to that point, actually, because I couldn't work out what to put in that offhand, which meant I had to, to use the green stuff to extend the arm, because otherwise it would have looked like he had one short arm, one long arm, and that just wouldn't have looked right with the flow of the model. As I mentioned at the start, that kind of, that feel, how the model feels. So a bit of minor gap filling and extending of the arm just meant that the, the scale felt a little bit better. And then on top of that, we've gone with the kind of arrogant posing in terms of pointing the sword up. He's challenging someone, but not in a kind of, you know, a Lucius kind of way. He's not smarmy about it. Um, and then, as you can see, I've added a few elements here. Um, just around the place I've shaved some of the the detail off and I've kind of gone for a less is more approach on this So as you can see I've added the tabard there um, The string with the skulls on I figure you know a champion who's renowned for taking heads could probably do with something like that And the tabard for the eagle-eyed amongst you is from Khan the Betrayer the, the Forge World Heresy version that is not the Games Workshop plastic version I've filed and trimmed down that chest plate that looks a little bit like a wrestling belt and added some brass and I added some um, some brass to the shin there and if I zoom in a little bit you might be able to see but I've had to sort of take a little notch out of the bottom of his shin plate to make sure that eagle sits snugly but that's about all I had to do with the shin really apart from bending the the brass around um, I've kept the hand off the arm on this in fact no, yeah, looking at that, actually, that's not a Primaris arm. That's the actual sword arm from the Praetor himself. All I've done is trimmed that rather overly large uh, sword down and given him um, a Palantine blade um, from the Forge World kit. And actually, apart from the the piece of Khan, the Empress Children Forge World bits I've added to this model are all from the Palantine kit um, from Forge World. And actually, I think that's kind of fits with what I wanted to achieve with this in terms of you know he's a sword master he's quite arrogant there's a little bit of oh knocking off the base there blue tack to the rescue um and there's a little bit of of emperor's children flair and there's a little bit of that arrogance that you might expect from a sword wielding expert within a failing arrogant legion itself but there's no need to be particularly wild comparatively there's still a little bit more than I've done to this more attack that I'll come on to but you can see the size difference straight away there. This guy is large, which makes converting these guys, the main challenge really is finding arms that fit properly or that look like they, they fit a little bit better. Um, as you can say, I've extended that arm, add a little bit of green stuff, smooth it down. Once it's painted, you won't know the difference. Not all. 
On top of the head, that rather large mohawk that I've added, that's also from this same Sword Guy plastic kit. I just figured that would look, you know, kind of pompous. Um, I didn't want to add too much flair to this guy outside of, you know, a little bit of, I don't need to worry too much about stuff. Uh, and again, another size comparison here. They're from the same box, the same kit, but that is noticeably larger. And there's a feeling, really, within the studio that actually this guy was planned to be a Terminator. Um, but they kind of changed their mind, potentially, because he is way out of scale compared to the rest of the Power Armored Marines in the new line. Um, but I'll shut up about that for now. Um, so, yeah, really, you know, this is a fairly straightforward bits assembly. And a lot of that actually comes from just talking to the client, but a big, a big, huge part of this, as with the rest of the process, as I mentioned, is just that thinking of how you want this model to look which is why in the series of questions that we ask when we ask people what they want to see from their conversions or what they want is a big part of, you know, what legion, but what position? Is it late heresy? Is it early heresy? Is there something in the law that might indicate, you know, a certain behavior or a certain adherence to some sort of combat uh, methodology? You know, late heresy world eaters, for example, are still going to be insane like they are early heresy, but there's going to be a few more bells and whistles in terms of looking a little bit more like full-scale Chaos Marines. But of course, that all comes from the brief. And one thing I want to talk about this with is, is perhaps something that people won't talk about during the commission process. You know, you're paying for a service, we're providing a service, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have to be perfect, and it's okay to change your mind. This is an example of a personal Abaddon model that I've been trying to make for a little while and I really wanted to use that claw because I, I think it looks so cool it looks different it looks menacing and mean but this guy has been sat on my workbench for a long time because something just doesn't feel like it fits the way I want it to fit and it probably means I'm actually going to go back and end up just using Abaddon as is from the Forge World kit the scale is about right the model is cool. It's from what I sometimes refer to as kind of the golden age of Forge World sculpting, where the detail is just excellent for what you get. It's not just what looks like, you know, kind of CAD design, all basic shapes plastered with stuff all over it. It's, it's lovingly crafted and sculpted, like some of the other pieces that I've got within this. But it's okay to change your mind and go back on a design. And this Emperor's Children Champion, actually, as the client will will be able to reiterate if he's watching, this has been sat on my desk for a little while because there were parts of the model that I just wasn't sure of. I Something didn't feel quite right. I didn't want to send it, you know, as a finished product without it feeling like a finished product. And to me, sometimes that's a big thing. You can complete something. You can look it around. You can check all the angles. You can look at everything something just bugs you in the back of your mind where you think that doesn't feel right and I talk a lot about feeling and I think that's something that some people have with their armies you know some people are happy to to build things as are paint them as is and that's fine you know but sometimes you have a feeling that you want to do a little bit more and to use that feeling is quite strong enter the Alpha Legion Praetor I've done very little to this model but I had a feeling that I just wanted the theme of this Praetor to be a little bit different. So I added the spear haft here to make his paragon blade or power sword into a paragon spear, essentially. And I gave him an offhand Volkine, which again, if you're good at spotting bits, is off the Night Lord's Praetor. But adding this spear haft was really simple. I believe this haft is off um, the Custodes banner bearer from the Prospero box. I think you can still get it. And then the, uh, not the box, sorry, that is the, the banner bearer. Um, and the end of the spear is just the end of what was on the handle of the, the power sword that the model comes with. And I figured, okay, a badass in Terminator armor wielding a power spear or paragon spear. He wants a gun, but he wants to be able to access the two quite easily without holstering and all that sort of nuisance business that might waste a few seconds that potentially gets him killed. So, he wants an offhand weapon that enables him to use his spear at the same time. 
enter the part of the Night Lord Praetor. He's got an empty hand, he's got a wrist mounted Volkite, which again in itself looks cool. I'm a big fan of Volkite for anyone who's seen um, images of my Alpha Legion. Um, Volkite wherever possible, because who doesn't love the idea of a microwave gun melting face? Um, or a heat gun, Martian ray gun, however you want to refer to it. But I just thought these parts worked together. And essentially all I've added to this is four pieces. Four pieces that I think have changed the aesthetic and the theme of this Praetor. He's not pointing a pistol, he's pointing a wrist-mounted weapon. He's not holding a power sword, he's holding a paragon spear, or a power spear. And then the power pack for the Volkite. And I just think that changes everything. And realistically, that's sometimes all you need. You just need a couple of simple changes to change the general feel of a model. Because he isn't just swinging a sword around like every other Praetor. He's holding this stylized spear to emulate his Primarch. And of course, if you know any of the Alpha Legion 30k lore, spears are a big thing to Alpharius. Um, and some of the, the books that detail how he wields a spear, how he trained with a spear, how he deconstructs it to sneak it around and take it with him, I just think is quite a cool idea, and then links this Praetor to his Primarch's affinity for that weapon, whilst also giving himself that kind of tactical edge, having a wrist-mounted weapon that means he can still two-hand his spear when he wants to. Of course, it has no real in-game impact. You know, a Paragon Blade can be represented with almost any model you want, um, any piece you want, any weapon. But I just think it's all about personal preference. And rule of cool. And rule of cool is banded around all the time, but is completely legitimate. And cool, of course, is subjective. And without going too far down that particular rabbit hole, um, rule of cool being subjective means that person A could do something that they think is cool, person B could do something different, and they would both disagree in terms of which is the coolest because of its subjectivity. And I'm not going to touch the rest of that conversation with the barge pole. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to one of the next models. And actually, this next model is perhaps one of my favourite, despite being arguably one of the simpler conversions that I've done. So this is um, what started out as a regular Reaver Sergeant. Um, even before I added this uh, this recent edition of the, the 3D printer jump pack, because it's just a little bit easier to get hold of 3D printer jump packs when you know someone with a 3D printer instead of having to buy all the kits. But the main point I wanted to convey in this is he's leading a group of quite aggressive combat orientated models. So one of the central themes of the thought process with this guy was that there had to be a sense of movement being conveyed by the model. Thankfully, as you can see, there's quite a lot in this model. And actually, just comparing him to a Mark VI, even though this is one of the very early sculpts um, released with Heresy, it's the, the Forge World Loken body sculpt, of course, uh, next to Abaddon, who come from you know the same kit that Forge World sell. This, this body from Loken actually stacks up quite well compared to some of the older kits that are a little bit slimmed down. But as well as the sizing and the scale and the detail, I, I strongly recommend that, well not necessarily recommend, but I strongly feel like this is one of the models from what I would probably call the golden era of heresy releases from Forge World, where the attention to detail from a person into this into this sculpt is just fantastic. But the sense of movement that this body conveys all on its own, without very much um tinkering and tampering is is frankly staggering really and because of um, the combination of the the duel between him uh, Loken and Abaddon that is released in that diorama there's just a sense of movement with the model and all I've had to do here really is add a couple of pieces in such a way that just reinforces and emphasizes that movement a little bit so the pointing arm with the flamethrower the flame pistol and the offhand with the power fist that offhand power fist is from the Reaver kit. The shoulder pad is from the Night Lord's um, 
Night Lord's dead pile on Lionel Johnson's base. And you can see that I've just had a little bit of green stuff to bring the arm out so it's not flat against his body to really convey, you know, kind of that sense of how a body might move while running forward. Your arms aren't down by your side unless you're sprinting. And then the aiming arm is also off one of the dead guys or the guy that's about to be dead on Lionel Johnson's base where he's pointing a Volkite. And all I've done there is cut the Volkite off and give him a flame pistol because I think the rule of cool in my head says that a legion famed for spear tip assaults trying to get into people's faces quickly it might not be the most powerful option but a crazy bloke with a jump pack running towards you with a power fist spraying flames in your face just feels really fitting for kind of late heresy era uh, sons of horrors which is what i'm trying to go for or mid to late heresy era um actually with the um the Zone Mortalis bases I've got here, I've tried to theme my bases off the Space Wolf Assault on the Vengeful Spirit and the Sons of Horus fleet, just as that kind of boarding action, that ship-to-ship -ship action. Um, and then all I had to do really was add, as you can see from the shoulder, the piece of Sons of Horus brass, the Sons of Horus power-armoured Praetor head, which I just think works perfectly. He's looking down his sights, even though you don't really want to aim down sights with a flamer but you know he's looking where he's shooting stick the, the jump pack on there and i just think this model with such little effort such little tinkering i mean just look i mean i know i'm biased because it's mine and it's one of my favorite models but i just think this piece is it so well encompasses that movement that you might expect you know he's kind of moving forward he's strafing a little bit to the right there's a purpose to this model and that's not something you get from a lot of models without a lot of tinkering but um, there's a reason <laughs> I have another Loken body I don't have a plan for it at this point but it's in the big bits box because I just know it's just such a good piece to use as a base for a model in motion and it'll probably end up being used um, on a commission or something in the future but I'm just so happy with this model and, you know, with one, two, three, four, five parts, six parts that don't come with this model, the heavy lifting is really being done by the body here. Um, you can see just, I might have to take that lump off under his foot, but it mounts the body so perfectly that I just, I don't really want to tinker with it, if I'm completely honest with you. You know, the way the legs are sculpted, the way they're positioned... He's moving forward with purpose. And I know I've said that word purpose or, you know, kind of um, speed and movement, but I just think it's it's right for this model. And then onto the second Reaver Sergeant that I've done. Again, I've used one of the, the classic sort of Forge World sculpts. This is based on Khan, although it's using Loken's head. Um, a head you don't see used too much, I don't think. And this conveys movement, I think, but in a slightly more chaotic and rampant way which i think fits you know with the khan sculpt that this is based on but it's a bloke wielding a mace he's not carrying a fist it's a weapon he's swinging around he doesn't convey the same amount of balance or forward movement forward momentum it's almost like a i've i'm just kind of swinging around from having beaten someone to death with this giant mace and I'm kind of trying to swing my way around and move forward in a slightly different way. Uh, the head is blue tacked as opposed to actually secured properly. I'm probably going to maybe tinker with that to get the, the way he's looking the direction a little bit differently. Might align that more with the way he's pointing the mace. Um, but again, like Loken, there is very few changes to this model. And it's not one of my favourites like the Loken Sergeant is. Um, I had to do some changes. As you can see, I've green stuff smoothed his groin piece because there's that indentation where his tabard should be. Um, of course, the tabard where I used for the Emperor's Children Champion earlier in the video. Um, the offhand is just a plastic Mark IV. It fits quite well with the swing. I think I might have to bring it out a little bit so it's raised a bit more, like he's kind of using it, swinging it around to help with that momentum. Um, but the biggest change you'll probably notice is probably the shins, actually. Uh, sorry, the knee pads, actually. And that's because the Khan knee pads, if any of you are familiar with it, are kind of sculpted with World Eater's iconography. And it felt a little bit... 
like a cheat or a shortcut just to smooth that out and make you know kind of normal knee pads so i went for that kind of aggressive they're raised they're not pointed they're not sharp but there's definitely a kind of a brutal edge you know someone comes barreling in um even if he's not paying the most attention those knee pads to the face or chest even if you're wearing power armor are probably going to sting a little bit and i think that's the kind of the difference here with these sergeants and i think a little bit more like you would expect with again anyone who's familiar with the law the the difference in the members of the Mornaval, horus's confidants his right hand man men is something i kind of wanted to try and convey in the difference between sergeants i didn't want them all to be the same you know with my alpha legion army they're all routinely similar they don't necessarily stand out from the squad they blend in etc etc like alpharius and i guess the sergeants here i wanted to get that difference in personality between them you know the other one the other reaver sergeant is kind of striding with intent i won't use the p word again um <laughs> He's striding forward with intent. He knows what he's doing. He's focused. He's concentrated. This sergeant, however, you know, he's thrown his helm away or he's not wearing it. He's a little bit more careless. He's swinging around a mace as opposed to a fist. So there's a little bit more of a brutal, you know, kind of bludgeoning death to this individual. He's a lot less balanced, but that's no less um, deadly in terms of how he conducts himself. And just pointing out there, you can probably see, you know, some of the details on the chest and stuff. I left those because I think they just look really cool. The extra detail, again, from um, the older era of some of the models. And then moving on to my Moritap. And actually, I think out of all the models I'm showing you here, this is the, the model I've had the absolute least involvement with changing. Um, essentially, all I've done is cut the head out off the previous model, put a more aggressive sons of horus head on there i need to tidy up the neck seal a little bit but again once i weather it and stuff you probably wouldn't see much of that and then these two pistols and i think the pistols are really actually the standout part of this model and as a you know as you'll relate to earlier in the video one of the things i said is sometimes you will base a model around an idea but other times you will base a model around a piece you want to use and actually this um the the suggestion for these pistols came from elsewhere in the studio when i was trying to find appropriate proxies for disintegrator pistols i think you know there are a few options out there the archaeo textile pistols off the old praetor um off the phalanx warder or templar brethren kit from forge world i forget which kit it is but again the pistol that's in that um but i just think these actually make him look different but also he's got two uniform pistols he looks a little bit like a cowboy because they look kind of like futuristic six shooters they have that implied heft and weight to them you know they're not sure this is a pistol that almost looks like a, a pistol version of a shotgun in some sense and just makes him look like he's a gun-toting lunatic um of course once we paint him up and stuff that will that will be reinforced but you know this is one of the simplest conversions i've done but i think those pistols are really the standout it makes his arm reach huge they're probably completely unwieldy but he's going to jump in with a squad of destroyers spreading space cancer around with their radiation weapons and he's just going to start blasting and yeah he might hurt or kill himself but it'll look cool as hell doing it which is the theme i went for with that one and that's you know the reinforcing theme here is that you don't always need to go completely insane with the parts you put on a model to make them look cool sometimes it can just be three or four parts to meet your own internal preference so here we come to one of the most if not the most involved model within this video within this collection of conversions that i'm showing off and this is a commission um, for a chap in america who wanted a series of custom night lords characters some of which are based on existing lore and some of them are based on existing artwork this is a, a chap based on one of the the flame masters of the night lords i i'm not even going to try and say his name because i don't recall it properly but there's artwork of him out there with a kind of skull helm and this apothecarian arm kit like you can see on the back here and this is very much an example of trying to match a piece in physical form that relates quite specifically to existing artwork 
And as you might remember from the beginning of the video, I actually mentioned that this can be possibly, in my opinion, one of the hardest challenges is when you don't necessarily have that creative freedom to complete something from scratch. But what you're trying to do is emulate a piece of existing artwork. And of course, artwork is kind of a little bit more flexible in terms of how it can portray items and individuals and scenery because there's a flexibility where you don't necessarily have the restriction of having to keep to certain physical dynamics of um, plastic pieces or even just that appearance of how body parts move around the body. You know, for example, the artwork of Praetorian of Dawn Dawn is swinging his chainsaw down in such a way that it doesn't actually look incredibly realistic if you try to emulate that with Dawn, the actual model that Ford will sell, which at this point in time I'm actually trying to repose for another commission, which is why I'm using that reference. Um, but with this, there was a few elements of, you know, kind of tried and true methods that I use for creating apothecaries. For example, that forearm there with the, the chain blade on, that's a Primaris arm, with a Ford World chain sword that's trimmed down with the power pack to, to sort of create that. The arms off the backpack are off Fabius Bile. And actually they're a fairly good example of how sometimes you may have to buy a whole kit to get the parts you're after. Because in looking for the pieces for those for that backpack on eBay and such, people are looking for, you know, 15, 20 quid pounds, sorry, should I say, um, just for those those pieces off the backpack now from the right gaming store third party fabius himself is only about 20 pounds so there's no real point in spending all that money just for those parts when you can buy the whole kit use what you need and then recycle the rest into future conversions so i've also used as you can see from the side there i just pointed out was uh, fabius's tool kit um, as well as the arms but they're the only real pieces i've used there other than that, this is a collection of Mark IV pieces, some of the Night Lords upgrade kits that Ford World used to sell, a new Mark VI body, some green stuffing, as you can see, as well as the, uh, the addition of the chains, the skulls, and the, the tabard, which is probably the most involved piece I've done on this model apart from the chest. The chest piece is actually a manipulated chest that comes in the old or came in the old uh, night lords ford world upgrade kit where again because i was trying to emulate the artwork here i had to trim down and smooth a few parts of that torso to add the sort of the spiked motive the edging that you can see with the green stuff miller put mix around the top um before going on to the sort of the skin tabard that you can see which is a mix of uh, green stuff and miller put in different stages down at the middle and if we look at this model a little bit closer um, in a second, you'll be able to sort of see the texture and um, the other things that have, we've done on the, on the tabard. And then as you can see, I've just sort of smoothed out and um, given a little bit of texture to that forward shin. Um, there was an original plan to add a sort of um, motif or, you know, kind of armor edging type there but i decided against it so just zooming in here so you can see a little bit more of the detail um that skin tabard as you can see it's quite rough there's like a um a bullet hole or a wound of some sort within it once it's painted up i think this will look really cool um in terms of you know the, the flesh tones that pale flesh tone this flame master is probably as likely to hurt you as help you and as you can just sort of see on that left hand edge between the skull on the chain and the tabard itself, there's a little bit of uh, chain mail green stuff in. And that's just to, again, give it some depth in terms of it's not just applying a flat surface and manipulating the top of it with some sculpting to add that, that layer and that texture. And that's what I'm saying, you know, underneath that whole skin tabard, it's all green stuff chain mail but all you can see is that tiny little bit on the left. And sometimes it's about adding that layer to give the perception of depth. If anyone's seen, for example, on my, my Instagram channel in terms of showing how we add layers to create um, that perception of depth in molded hair, for example, that I did on um, a Torgodon commission uh, last year I believe early last year where we add layers and then sculpt and manipulate that to give again that layered perception of hair flopping or combing or doing whatever it's going to do um, and then just from the shin you can see there's a slightly different approach to skin in that's a piece that was also cut off um, 
one of the corpses on Lionel Johnson's scenic base, where I basically just sort of had to trim the leg down, carve it all out, and provide, you know, that kind of shin plate of skin, because this guy apparently likes taking off people as much as he does patching it back on. Um, and then, like I said, that non-traditional approach to the apothecarian, in terms of he's got these mechanised arms that give him that apothecary kind of feel, um, harm assist, as someone has said previously. Um, and I quite like that. So as I say, this guy is one of the more detailed conversions that I've done recently. Sometimes that's the way it is with um, with commissions. Other times it's purely because I've enjoyed that creative freedom, um, relative creative freedom, even though you know it's kind of trying to relate to a piece of artwork. But I'm really happy with this guy. And I think similar to the previous models, but different, there is a sense of movement and intent with this model. You know, he's kind of confidently striding forward. He's not hiding on the battlefield, but he has such a sense of confidence and even arrogance in terms of he's not a warrior, but he's going to stride around the battlefield doing as he pleases. And the customer is ultimately happy. And I'm happy because, you know, there's nothing nicer than seeing your work appreciated in terms of the effort you put forward for it. And that's not why we do what we do, but when someone's paying you to make a com um, conversion for them, it kind of helps a little bit. Um, so that's the Night Lord's Apothecary. Overall, you know, quite happy with the Mark VI and the combination of parts. Things don't mismatch too badly. Um, as I think I've mentioned before, you do tend to need Primaris arms when you're using conversions on these, but that's not a huge problem. You can always trim them down and, and change how things look. So then, moving on to the second to last piece we have here. And this is a model that actually um, I, was, I was enlightened upon after completing rather frustratingly and this is my sons of horus master of signal i almost entirely created this guy quite in an, a quite ad hoc fashion because i'm gonna run a black reaving right of war sons of horus list for a couple of events later this year um which i'll post some some updates and images from but i originally built this guy as a kind of suicide unit i saw him as a tax um, that is until someone on the internet kindly pointed out that actually they'd seen an update in the FAQ. So the thing that made this guy quite bad, i.e. his Vox, Vox Disruptor, was something you could now turn on and off. So he wouldn't just disrupt everything. So that kind of changed how this sprung about, but that's why he exists. Making this part was difficult because I knew I wanted to have you know this point in hand, um, the the technology and the, the the tablets and stuff that he's holding in one hand, um, and have that master of signal feel to him. So, you know, his offhand um, is pointing to the prime uh, his primaris arm pointing. There's the old master of signals um, wrist mount there, or almost like a pip boy from Fallout, and then the sort of 3D map that's off the new vehicle upgrade sprue, as well as his little antenna on the headset, which I don't think you really need. He's kind of got the big antennas in the back of his dome on that helmet, but I just think it looks quite cool personally. So that's off the new Mark VI, Mark VI um, infantry upgrade sprue. There's the antenna off the, the Vox guy again for the new Mark VI and then the large resin antenna is off the Solar Auxilia command kit, this piece here um, I just have that because I bought the Solar Auxilia command kit for a separate project, it's quite an expensive part to just try and get yourself um, unless you can pick one up from somewhere but I bought the whole kit for some Necromunda and other conversions and then sold the rest of the bits but kept that because I knew I'd want it at some point and here we are um, and then that power pack on the back of his power pack is off the old, well, not old, current even, it's just an old part for me, um, sorry, is the Forge World Recon Kit. It's a piece off one of the Sergeant backpacks, I believe. So, for the most part, this was quite a, a relatively easy conversion. Some of the parts went together quite well. You know, the, the console went on his Pip-Boy quite well with a little bit of trimming. I did have to, as you can see here, trim the back of his dome helmet down because it didn't really interact with the backpack in the right way. Um, I think that part was designed, you know, kind of to be looking forward, not off to one side. So the kind of, uh, like I say, cone head approach wasn't really ideal. And then from that forearm, you can sort of see there's some slight evidence of trimming. As I say, that's a Primaris arm. I had to trim that down, otherwise it would look like he'd been 
up to some extracurricular activity with the arm that he wasn't with the rest of his arm, uh, with his other arm, sorry. So I had to trim at the wrist to get the hand right. Fairly simple cut, nice smooth cut. Trimmed a couple of um, the edges down so it didn't look as fat. Um, got the connector on there so again i don't think it looks too out of place compared to the body because what you've got to remember is this body is one of the forge world reavers they are a little bit anemic in terms of the older sculpts that are a little bit slimmer you know i mentioned that with with the abaddon and Loken sculpts earlier that they're not too bad proportionally i think because they're heroes whereas the the reavers and some of the other resin um, infantry from the time was quite slim these haven't aged too badly because there's armor panels and some, some stylizing on the shins and the knees and stuff, um, so they're not too bad. So that arm doesn't look too out of place with a little bit of trimming. If I hadn't have adapted the arm, it would probably look too long, too bulky, and just wouldn't quite work. Um, I think, as we've managed it here, it looks fairly safe. Um, but as I say, this started as um, something I needed to include in the list, so I probably gave this not the most amount of thought if i'm honest i just had a few bits to play with i scrambled them all together to sort of see what i wanted to achieve there were a few bits that i was happy to use you know like the antenna and the little 3d map that he's holding in his left hand but other than that i kind of i didn't want to spend too much time and effort on this because as i say i saw him as a suicide unit unfortunately that's now changed so i'm probably going to look to add something to his base like um you know a nemesis bolter or something that i put kind of leaning up against a rock or a dead body or something so he's kind of he's taken some shots he's set himself up he's decided to start issuing commands and stuff again um of course you know he's a master of signal but he's part of the the traitor host he's still going to want to collect him some skulls and some marks on the on the armor there um other than that i think this is you know a fairly straightforward approach um it's just how like i say you think about constructing and what you want to achieve i still wanted even though this character was a, a suicide unit i still wanted there to be some character i didn't just want to use a standard master of signal i also didn't just want to to use a mark six guy with a single antenna on his back i just i can't do it like that um i sometimes over engineer a solution for a simple um a simple problem but um sometimes you end up with stuff you really like i think overall um this is fairly simple straightforward like i say um, but that's that's him. There's not much thought there. And then we move on to um, a perfect example of a model that exists purely because I wanted to use a single part in my bits, bits box. And of course, there'll be those of you out there who completely understand what I'm talking about. You'll be scrolling through... Um, instagram or facebook seeing pictures of other people's models you'll scroll through the catalogs online and you'll see a part and you just think to yourself right i want to use that and this is a prime example this is my chieftain banner bearer for the exemplary units um profile for the sons of horus the chieftain squad this is the part i want to use the banner the sons of horus command banner I just think this is such a cool piece. There's so much character in an arm holding a piece of cloth with some skulls and chains on it. And I just think it looks so much more characterful than some of the other banners that for even Forge World released. You know, some of the ones you see on the generic Mark IV or Mark III command sets, they're just, you know, as uh, an unfilled piece of cloth that doesn't really convey much movement or character. It's just there to have a um, you know a transfer or a decal or some freehand put on it this however just feels a lot more like there's a meaning or there's some kind of arrogance or you know middle of the battlefield kind of aim to it of course he's not letting it hang free there's a an almost an element of i don't really want to be holding this so i'm not just going to stand there with a target on my back but i'm going to hold up the bit the bit that matters which is this top banner it's all ruffled up in the middle. Again, the detail on that is amazing. Again, one of the older Forge World sculpts that I just think can't really be rivaled with some of the newer designs that they push out. Um, again, caveat, that's personal taste. Not everyone will agree. That's fine. We're all grown-ups. We can agree and disagree. That's not a problem. But this is just one of those pieces that I had to use and wanted to use. The problem with that 
is the body this banner comes with. The body, the legs, they're just not in scale with the keeping of the rest of how the heresy, um, the game has moved. So my initial plan was, as you might be able to tell because of the green stuff on the arm joint, my initial plan was to try and go the difficult route of carving the arm off and just trying to have the arm holding the banner up. Because as try as I might, I couldn't really find an arm that fit the right pose in this sense of I don't want him to be moving because, again, the banner doesn't really convey that element of movement. It's static. Um, I wanted it to be holding something right without having to change too much. And I was going to cut down the arm joint, take the arm off the off the torso, cut round the um, the shoulder pauldron. Um, but that was proving to be too difficult. And then I looked at it and thought, actually, you know what? The legs aren't very good because they're a bit slim. But I really like this body. And actually, when you look at it, it is a really cool torso. You know, the armor's different. It's stylized. There's ridges. There's some points to it. There's, you know, there's just a little bit more thought to it. So I thought, right, the solution there is not to take the arm off, hence why I filled the gap with green stuff and made it into a soft armor joint. The solution is just to remove the legs. Unfortunately, the legs... In typical old Forge World fashion with these character models, the legs come attached to the torso. So there was quite a lot of clipping and carving. And sometimes when you go through this process, you'll be able to remove parts from uh, from models and reuse them. Um, yeah, that's really not the case with the legs I took off this. This is basically just a pile of chopped up resin that would be more suitable for a rubble pile on a base. But they aren't what I wanted. They're what I want to get rid of because they were too slim and they didn't look right. So once I'd chopped all that off, kept the little tabard, thought about adding the chains, and I managed to, as you can sort of see at the back there, I've managed to take the pouches off the old leg torso divide, which was fiddly work, um, probably doesn't add much overall, but is what I wanted to do. And even there, you can only just see the join line between the legs and the torso, because it's just that attention to detail on the bits that will be seen and matter. So then, the argument came up of, not argument, but the discussion point of, right, which legs do I use? Because I need to use legs that also convey an element of arrogance. And perks of having an extensive bits box because of numerous conversions and other crazy ideas throughout history are a spare pair of Ralderon legs. I used parts of his body for a conversion, parts of his base didn't use the legs. So the legs actually fit perfectly here. I had to trim the groin section down on the legs for the joint to fit that tabard down, but the tabard's there, no one cares, you can't see it. Trim the detail off the shins, add a Sons of Horus eye, stick some chains on, Bob's your uncle, fan is your aunt. And I think, you know, I don't like this trend of models coming with tactical rocks. This guy is standing on something given that the theme of the army is a zone mortalis theme or industrial theme i'll have to have a girder or something for him to be stood on which isn't as bad i don't think but that is what it is with the torso and the body the next problem i had is the chieftains come with breacher shields boarding shields and basically every sculpt of that piece um comes for the left hand, the hand that is using or holding the banner. So I had to think a little bit outside the box. And this shield, if um, any of you recognize it, is actually off the Enforcers from the Necromunda kit. I had to have a little bit of fiddling with the arm. So just pointing out the, the chains there in terms of they're still loose. I know some people ask occasionally how we secure chains like this do we leave them loose do we apply you know thin layer of super glue to keep them from moving um in these this case i'll probably thinly brush over them with some super glue to keep them in place but back to the shield as you can see there's a little bit of stylization on this i've filled some gaps with green stuff um i can't actually recall what i was pointing out on the hand of the the banner there but we'll move past that like it didn't happen um so the shield the skulls and the chain I was going to add that to whichever boarding shield I picked in the first place. But the shield itself needed a little bit of work to make it look less 40k Necromunda like it comes. So I filled those gaps in with green stuff. I'll apply some battle damage to it once we've started to paint and add weathering. 
this spiked uh, shoulder pad, although looking cool, caused me some problems. Um, as you might be able to see, the way it interacts with the shield there, I had to angle the shield at a certain angle, otherwise the spikes on the bottom of the pauldron were, were sort of pushing it too far away from the body, like it would have pushed it across the front of the body. Um, as you can see there, I had to construct a kind of handhold for him, for the shield to attach to the back of his hand. Um, that's just an offcut of um, a power axe handle from Forge World, I believe, and the plate on the bottom is just um, a smooth and rounded off piece of plastic card or styrene card, however you want to refer to it. And then that's actually Ralderon's arm as well, Ralderon's off arm. As you can see, just about from the green stuff underneath the pauldron at the top there, I had to cut at the just above the elbow and rotate the arm round um, because. Any of you are familiar with Ralderon, he's holding the sword across his body. Um, obviously that's not the pose we wanted, so I just had to rotate that round, smooth some green stuff off so it's holding down by his side, and then go with that stylized shield. The skulls, the brass, the chain. And I think that kind of completes the look. I mean, the shield is probably the part I'm the least happy with on that model, but overall I still really like it. And he'll probably get shot off the board by a Nemesis Boller in the first game I use him, because Curse of New Models... New model syndrome, as some might call it. And that's broadly an in-depth look at each of the conversions I had on the deck at this point. So, overall, this has been... Get the family back together for a group photo. Looks like a boy band from the 30th uh, millennium. Um, this has been a walkthrough in terms of just trying to show that not every model has to be hyper detailed or hyper planned out ahead of time um, to be effective. Some of these you'll have a single part in mind for for constructing the model. You know the banner, um, the body, like with Loken. I think that's such a cool body to use for the basis for so many conversions as well. By the way, um, other times it might just be that you end up creating something over time you know you might recall with the the emperor's children guy um he was sat on the desk for so long because i hit a brick wall and as i mentioned with my abaddon conversion i've gone back and forth with him and i've ended up going back to pretty much how he comes out of the box with his claw and his sword i'll probably change the sword because it's a paragon blade but i you know it's <laughs> the overall aim was to try and show that it's an approachable process i think sometimes it can be quite daunting to go through this much change, chopping up Forge World resin, um, you know, I've I'm in the process of having completely dejointed and reposed Rogel Dawn. Chopping up a Primark was very daunting, even for for myself, who who's done a lot of these types of conversions of changing models into different versions of of how they came out of the box. But it doesn't have to be intimidating, you know. Ultimately, it's all down to your own creativity and how you think about what you want to accomplish or achieve. And the basic principles, you know, is the same as driving. You, It's daunting while you're learning, but once you do it enough and you do it over time, it becomes familiar. And I think that's the thing with converting and doing stuff. And, I, you know, I, I speak from a relatively privileged position in the sense that some of this stuff does just make sense to me. That doesn't mean it makes sense to everyone, and that's fine, you know. Other stuff makes sense to other people that doesn't make sense to me, and that's how creativity, I guess, works. That's not to say I'm special in any way. This is all stuff that is completely replicatable. Um, and that leads me rather nicely to the fact that some people um, off the channel have actually insinuated or suggested that they might be interested in a kind of tutorial plan, um, a lesson plan, um, you know, kind of mentoring around how to take a model from how it comes out of the box into something completely unique like some of the models we see here. That is something that we would probably have to do on Patreon or some sort of paid service because, of course, we all have full-time jobs. But if that is something that people would be interested in after seeing this, you know, to, to learn a bit more about the process, to learn about how to be able to do this yourselves with some one-to-one -one mentoring, some class mentoring, if that's something that you would be interested in, let us know in the comments. Um, and it's something we can look 
to in the future. Of course, we need a certain amount of buy-in to make it plausible, but I think this is a prime candidate. You know, we people do um, other mentoring plans to make parts of the hobby more accessible. You know, painting, um, hobbying in general, master classes for sculpting, all those sorts of things, which I wouldn't do at this point because I don't think I'm advanced enough to be offering master classes in stuff. But I think. Uh, yeah, this is part of a series of trying to make some of the stuff in the hobby that might seem like black magic into something that feels a little bit more accessible. And we're happy to do more of that in the sense of trying to keep that gate open for accessibility and help people come become more comfortable with stuff like this. Because, of course, it all makes the hobby cooler. And the cooler the hobby is generally the more fun we're going to have at games seeing cool, interesting new models. And that only really happens the more people feel they're comfortable with it and buy into this sort of, um, you know, kind of rule of cool rather than rule of whack. And you know who you are, people in the community, even friends I've got within um, hobby groups. But I hope this was useful and interesting and helped people to see a different side of this process rather than just the finished result and that's one of the reasons why I quite like posting uh, work in progress pictures I think it's good to see the process it doesn't always look polished there's a, a rough side to it certainly um, but I hope you all enjoyed it and thank you for joining us as I said if there are any comments anything you'd like to see us do or you'd be interested in the kind of the, the tutoring with this sort of uh, process and procedure just let us know and we'll we'll add you to the list we'll keep in touch and we'll go from there so thanks very much and we'll see you next time